I think, I mean, there's a lot of debate and people have been speculating on what consciousness is for a very long time. Um, our work doesn't focus directly on consciousness, but uh, I s a lot of people, of course, think about consciousness in different ways. I think from a very material, material or materialistic uh, perspective, one could think of consciousness as something that arises when there's a critical mass of communication. But the communication can't be scrambled, it has to make sense, it has to have lots of rules and laws. Because we know that, you know, if you have an anesthetic, you scramble the rules and then you're not conscious, but the brain is still very active. So it requires some kind of critical amount of activity and it requires some kind of critical amount of causal interactions. Um, I think that it probably also is related to the fact that we don't really see the world with our eyes or ears. We, we construct models of the world. So the brain is, is um, very actively involved in recreating its own version, subjective version of the world. And consciousness may be related to us becoming aware of our own model creation. But I think it'll take some time for us to dig into the, the understanding of consciousness. We'll probably understand more about what, new, what we call the neural correlates of consciousness. That means that we can see this consciousness, we can see the certain neural states, but what consciousness itself actually is, is uh, still up for discussion. Well, I mean, it is a distributed network, but it's not only a distributed network, it's also very local processing, a neuron is an extremely local processor. It has probably a billion proteins that are interacting and producing an extremely complicated uh, state, which is uh, changing from birth and until the end of one's life. Um, little circuits between neurons are creating very, very closed networks that they don't have any hierarchy, they don't have hubs like in the internet. But when you start to connect these together in a large area of the brain, you start to get these hubs um, of distributed uh, networks. So, and then a single neuron, uh, it does need thousands of other neurons to function. So a single neuron on its own can't really do very much. If it does, it'll probably be a disease. A single neuron lives in an ecosystem. So by definition, it is a distributed system. It depends on, there are many different interpretations of a distributed system. Well, I think that uh, the theory of networks or network topology is, is relevant. I think it is an important aspect to understand what is the architecture of how neurons are connected to each other. I doubt it's going to be enough. I think that uh, we're going to require uh, probably much more abstract theories of uh, geometry and geometrical topology. Uh, to be able to really understand the geometrical rules of the brain that allows it to build models that have a perceptual dimension. So I think network topology is important. Um, we, we can understand more or less the correspondence between how neural systems are connected to how nature has found solutions, the internet, social networks, uh, things like that. And we already can see some basic principles. We know that the whole brain is connected with a lot of hubs, you know, like Amazon is a hub in the internet. There are hubs, the visual system has a hub for vision. But when you go to a local point, there are no more hubs. Then there's no hierarchy, every neuron is the same perfect democracy. So we can use network principles to understand some of the basic uh, mechanisms by which the neurons are processing information, strategies. Well, I think it's a, it's a much more uh, simple 
than what people may like to make of it. I think what is very clear is that everybody benefits through social interaction. And uh, when we have a discussion, it catalyzes the way that I think, uh, how I'm going to phrase things, uh, and in the same way for you. And so when people do interact, it elevates the awareness and it elevates the, the I suppose you could call it maybe consciousness that is elevated. So as uh, people interact more, they do help each other to develop much more in terms of the cognitive uh, processing. I think if you had to sit on an island by yourself, you definitely would not be able to evolve your and develop your cognitive skills in the same way as if you were intensely involved in interactions. Well, for many years, uh, w researchers and, and even parents, they were led to believe or they did research where they believed that most of the autistic brain is malfunctioning. It's uh, even in the classical catalog of medicine, the DSM classification, autism is classified in the same part as mental retardation. Which means that, now mental retardation means that the neurons or the synapses or the connections, they're not functioning properly, they can't work. And what you need to do is you need to really, you know, in, give them intense training. And What we discovered is that it's exactly the opposite. Uh, that the brain is supercharged. It can learn much more than our brain. It is more connected. Um, it processes faster, it produces much stronger reactions. So we call this hyperfunctional brain. And actually what it means is that, you know, if this theory, we've, this is based on experiments, but if the theory, we call it the intense world theory, if this theory really holds, it means that you've got to be very careful when you have an autistic child to be too aggressive and strong in training, you should actually do the opposite. You should be very calm. Don't surprise them. Allow them to gently get into the world. You know, we all want our children to, to flourish, so we give them everything, enrichment. And we think that this enrichment actually can end up being very bad for an autistic child because they're already so in intense about the world. And as they get too intense, it becomes painful. So it becomes aversive. So they withdraw from the world because it's too intense. So we actually think that the, 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 the problem in autism is really not mental retardation. That's a misclassification. The problem is that the circuits have become primed and genetically they've become, there's an overactivity, more connections are formed. All the molecules that allow you to learn more are excessively expressed. And so, you have a supercharged brain. Touch is, is, is a romanticizing what an autist is capable of doing. There they take it to the extreme, of course, where the autistic child is capable of seeing the entire universe and all the rules and all the principles in terms of mathematics. And when they see a number changing, then they can identify where in the world that, num that source of the change is and then he can, you know. So, of course, that it's just illustrates that these, these kids are special and I think, uh, I, I think society is getting to realize that more and more. They are special kids. They are not mentally retarded, they don't need, shouldn't be treated in the same way. As kids that are incapable, one should help them to communicate, one needs to be very gentle in, in trying to rehabilitate them. For us, I'm a neuroscientist, I've been studying the brain for 25, maybe 30 years, and uh, I've been digging into it like everybody. And I think at one, you get to a point where you think, where is it going to go? So if I dig for another 20 years, is it going to help solve the problem and understand the brain and understand diseases? And, and then I see everybody else doing the same thing. Everybody's digging in different places. And when people study diseases, this one studies Alzheimer's, this one autism, schizophrenia, and everybody's fragmented. The research is fragmented, the data is fragmented, the knowledge is fragmented. The idea of the Human Brain Project is to put it together. 
And to do that, you need to build new technology. We have to use the state-of-art technology that's there to help us put all the pieces together. And the best way to put the pieces together is to build into a unifying computer model. At least that's the only way I can think of doing it. Uh, they, you can try databases, but you know, you, the, the brain is a complex multi-level system. It operates on uh, 10 to the 19 orders of magnitude of differences in time. Uh, a billion uh, scales of uh, space. You need to use a model and a supercomputer to simulate that all and put it together. So the Human Brain Project is uh, at the core is about simulating the brain, ultimately, the human brain. Um, it's about beginning the process, about building the technology so that this can all happen, all the pieces can come together. So we actually know what we've generated, we know what we don't know, we find maybe better strategies to fill in gaps in knowledge. And then it's also about uh, addressing uh, brain diseases, in a, but in a, in a new way. In a, um, it's not just res more research into brain diseases, which has to happen, that's very important. It's about putting all the diseases together so we can compare them with each other. It's about comparing which disease is more similar to another disease and looking for signatures. These are mathematical signatures so that if this is all the diseases of the brain, you can position every disease in its place. Um, that's, a new, that's a second dimension of the Human Brain Project. And then the third dimension is that we think that we need to make more aware the potential of understanding the brain to transform technology. And we think if that happens, um, a lot more funding will go to brain research. If we can actually demonstrate that uh, by understanding the brain, you can build better computers, you can build more intelligent robots, you can build better cameras that are intelligent, all kinds of technologies. Then I think that we will see a, a flood of funding into brain research and we are relying on you know, triggering these kind of accelerating mechanisms. It's just an imperative. We must understand the brain and I don't think we should take too long to do it. We should do whatever it takes to accelerate the process. So the Human Brain Project in summary is about understanding the brain, understanding its diseases and developing the technologies that you can by using principles of how the brain is functioning. This is an, uh, you know, what we're saying is that it's not one person that's going to understand the brain. We're saying we all need to get together. So we need a massive collaboration of thousands of scientists. So how do thousands of scientists work together? It's not easy. In CERN, it's a little bit easier because they have a very clear problem. They have a very clear facility. There is an accelerator. They all understand each other. In neuroscience, you, you don't understand each other. Uh, so we need to create a platform and that platform means we need to have informatic tools where we can database everything we know. We need to have tools where we can gather information from diseases in hospitals all over the world so we can compare diseases. We need to have the software that can build models of the brain that can digest all this data. And that software, it's a huge computer science challenge, so this is not neuroscience, it's computer science. Then you need supercomputers that can take these models and simulate them. Um, then uh, to exploit it, you need uh, a platform that will do what we call neuromorphic computing, which is where we can take the principles of how the brain is computing and we can print them into and configure uh, silicon chips so that these could become brain-like. Yeah, they will just have features, com powerful features of how the brain is computing. And then we can use these chips to advance technology. And then the, the last platform is what we call a, a neuro-robotics platform. And this is just an important platform to create a, a link between the, the brain models and the body and the environment. So by having a closed loop where the brain will guide a virtual or real robot within an environment, we can start to explore how uh, what, how, what are the mechanisms or causal chain of events that lead to behavior and cognition. So it's platforms, it's technology platforms. 
six technology platforms. And we're saying that Europe should do it, we can do it. it most of the, the work has pioneered in Europe. We're in a strategic opportunity to build it. We believe that if we build these platforms, it will accelerate everybody's research. This is about a service. This is a, a way of enabling that everybody will be able to do that research at an accelerated pace.